So uh, thank you for being here in uh, this talk called Onboarding on Scala. Uh, uh, my name is uh, really long, so you can call me Luis. Uh, that's my uh, Twitter uh, account, my GitHub account. If you, to, if you want to follow me, whatever. I'm a DevOps and data engineer at IHS Market. And I have been working professionally with Scala for a bit more than six years now. And uh, during these years, I have been working at many different uh, uh, companies uh, with different levels of, of adoption of Scala. And more often than not, I have heard that Scala is hard. Scala is, is a hard language. And at least it's daunting. I mean, it's, there are many things going with Scala. And the more experienced uh, uh, developers sometimes doesn't help to make a, a Scala any easier. Uh, because, for example, uh, it happened to me once that I moved uh, from a company where we were doing a pure functional uh, Scala, Reader Monad, Reader Monad, everything, all, everything that you can imagine, and I moved to a different company. And I landed in a team where just one person in the team had just started learning Scala. And so I did my first pull request, of course, purely functional. I submit the pull request, and there was a problem. I was the only one that could review that my own pull request. The URL said, yes, great, looks awesome, I have no idea what you're doing. So it's not that, it's that if I, for some reason, remove all the previous code and write the whole application in a purely functional style, I was the only one that could, be, could maintain it. That means that if there was any alert at uh, 3 a.m., I was the only one that could uh, go up, uh, get up and fix it. So that got me thinking, okay, there must be a way to introduce a scale in a company uh, with the goal of uh, ending writing pure functional Scala code, but that allows you to progressively introduce new and new features. And since then, I have been thinking about this, how to do it. I have tried different things at different companies, and today I'm going to show you how I'm trying to sol solve some of the problems that uh, people have when they, when they are uh, trying to use Scala. And one of the main complaints with Scala is that you have too many options to do one thing. I mean, Scala has uh, object-oriented uh, features, functional features, and you can add many, many libraries that uh, give you a lot of options to do something. And something as simple as uh, dependency injection, well, you can do, you can use a dependency injection framework, they work, at least use, they have the support for Scala. You can use a dependency injection uh, in the contractor, uh, constructor of a class, you can use the uh, implicit context, you can use the reader monad, you can even use the cake pattern if you are still willing to do it. So you see the problem here. If I were, I were a, Scala com a Java compa uh, programmer, I will have just to choose which dependency injection framework I will have to use. And that's it. There is only one way of doing this. But in Scala we can do many, many different things. Many different things. And what I would have done in the past, if I landed in a company and they asked me, okay, how do we do uh, dependency ingestion in Scala? I would say, okay, reader monad, period. There is no other option. That's confusing for some people. Uh, they don't even know what a monad is, so a reader monad is even beyond the, their understanding. So what I do now is I learn other languages, not just Haskell, Spoonarmel, or Camel. And I'm trying to organize my code in a way that loosely uh, resembles a uh, OCaml code. With, uh, instead of using classes and objects as an object system, I use classes and objects as a module system. My objects are modules without dependencies. My classes are modules that depend on other modules. And inside the modules, you can go as crazy as you want. You can do whatever you want in terms of pure functional programming. So you can introduce uh, pure functional concepts uh, in an easier and more uh, gradual way. Another complaint is the Scala is slow. Not that the language is slow per se, but if you are compiling a Scala code base, especially if it's a, a, a Scala code base that is using a, a lot of type level uh, uh, features, uh, the compiler is slow. And you can be a really big fan of Scala really experienced, 10 years of experience, and you will agree that it's still a slow compiler. But you will try to explain why it's slow. Because Scala has to do many more things than Java before going to 
for, while going from source code to, to byte code. The Scala compiler actually has 24 uh, different phases. You can try to explain all of them, try to explain people why we need to do this and that. And I'm not going to write down 24 uh, uh, phases. But also you can show this, uh, this chart to them. This is from Zalando. They did a, a test uh, to see how much time the Scala compiler spent on, on each of the phases. They found out the, the typer was the, the uh, they spent like 30% of the time on the typer. And that's a good thing because after that, is, uh, after that phase, everything type checks. So you know that everything is uh, uh, type checking. But if you are explaining why this Scala compiler is slow, or why it's okay that the Scala compiler is slow, uh, that way, you are missing the point because the, the point is what I get from the Scala compiler being slow. Uh, what uh, is uh, this additional compile time buying me? And we as programmers, as Scala programmers, functional programmers, what we have to do is to make illegal states uh, unrepresentable. So something that should not happen uh, in our application, we should not allow that to happen while we are writing code. I mean, if it's a user input, they can all, the users can make mistakes, but our code that is compiled could not end in an uh, illegal, in, in illegal state. Uh, so by using and abusing the type system and all these type features, what we are, we are doing is we are uh, investing time. So we are spending some time here, so we don't spend a lot of time at trying to run debug uh, runtime uh, issues. But even if you say that, some people say, well, whatever, I don't care. I want to use strings and ints, and I don't care about the, the type system. So there is still something you can do to check and help them to get a faster compile, uh, compile times. And you will be surprised, but a lot of people does that. They change a file, they go to the cell, SVT compile. They change another file, they go to the cell, SVT compile. So if somebody is complaining in your team, check if they're doing that. In, uh, in, and if they are doing that, tell them that there is an interactive mode on SVT. It took me like six months to realize that, that my, by myself when I was learning Scala. Because I was learning by myself, nobody was helping me, so it was like a, an amazing feature for me. Coming from Maven, of course, and Maven you do um, Maven compile or Maven build, and that's it. So that's what I was doing. And also you can introduce them to the till the compile mode, till the test mode that is watching the file system. And most of the time when you show that to people, suddenly they stop complaining about how slow compi Scala is, uh, compiling Scala is. So now that we have solved the issue with the compile times, we ha I have just mentioned SVT. SVT is terrible. Uh, I'm sorry you think that's true, I disagree. Maybe because I haven't had uh, any major problems with SVT, and, but, and why is that? Because I always use templates. I never write a single build file by myself. Why? Because I don't think anybody here understands fully what is going on on a build SVT file. And that's okay. So if somebody complains that the, scala, the, the SVT is complex, I'm building a build SVT is complex, tell them, just use a template, and over time you will learn more and more what is going on. And if you don't, it doesn't matter. Nobody really does. And then, another complaint, implicits. What's the problem with implicits? Uh, Scala is Scala because of the implicits. If you remove the implicits from Scala, you have a Java without semicolons. And if you are not going to use implicits, then what's the point of using Scala? Just use something else. Uh, but as powerful as they are, and as powerful, uh, 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 because with implicit we can uh, introduce the type class pattern and many other patterns, they are a source of uh, massive headaches. And I don't know if you can see that, I hope so, but uh, here is something that happened to me many, many, many times. You have a vector of numbers, and you try to add a, a number to the vector with a plus operator, and the Scala compiler complains because uh, the number you're trying to add is not a string. And you start looking at the screen and you say, well, but I have a, a vector of uh, in integers. I'm trying to add an integer. Where the hell is that uh, string coming from? 
and you spend like one hour, two hours, you go to a Stack Overflow, you try to figure out what the hell is going on because the code is full work, and suddenly you find out that uh, the vector class doesn't have a plus operator. But the Scala compiler is so helpful that he said, oh, well, if you want to use the plus operator, I can transform your vector into a string so you can use the plus operator and concatenate this string to another string. But you have an integer, and that's not a string. So I complain because you are trying to use this plus operator from the string class, and you are providing me with an integer. And when you realize that that is happening, you know, everything makes sense. But that's not a, a good thing to waste time just because of that. It's, this is so common that some people just uh, change the, uh, when they are importing the Scala, uh, they change uh, the imports so they get rid of that uh, implicit conversion. And this is okay, but imagine that you are using a library like, uh, I don't know, AKHGP. You want to serialize your classes to, to JSON. So you have some kind of Marshall, maybe play JSON, whatnot. The, or, the way you write that is using implicit uh, derivation. You don't want to write all the implicit uh, for every single case class. When you mix implicit derivation with case classes and uh, implicit derivation is a function that has a, uh, this is going to be produce an implicit base, another implicit, things go even more crazy. So, but as I said, implicit are what make a Scala a Scala. So what can we do to, uh, uh, to help people that are having problems with implicit? Uh, sadly, not much. We can help them to understand why something is failing, learn, uh, teach them how to learn these errors, but you, it's something you need to uh, live with, uh, learn to live with, and, and, uh, and go on. And the last point is the jargon. And this is a complaint that we all have heard many, many times. And what's the jargon? Okay. A monad is just a monad of a category of endofunctions. So what's the problem? And for me, this was a really funny thing to say to anybody that was starting with Scala. Let's tell them that's a joke. But then I, last month, I went to a talk from a friend. And I finally, understand, I finally understood what the problem is. In that sentence, we have monoid, category, and endofunctor. And if somebody is asking you what a monad is, they probably don't know what a monoid, a category, of an endofunctor is. So what they are going to do? Okay, let's go and try to figure out what an endofunctor is. It's a functor from one category back to the same category. Great, only just one new word, functor. Keep going. What is a functor? It's a mapping or homomorphism between categories. Okay, I, I can go on and go on and go on go down the rabbit hole of trying to understand the whole definition. And you know that it's easier to use a monad than trying to understand that definition of a monad. Using a monad is, you are using monads without even realizing. So when we are trying to explain a functional programming concept to people, we need to be careful on how we explain these concepts. Because instead of using these abstractions that are really powerful, they are going to chase this, uh, this rabbit down the hole and they are going to go to another wall and go back to whatever language we were using before. So what do we do? Do we use metaphors? Like monads are like a burrito? Well, that's also a problem because for me, I'm Spanish, that's a burrito, a little longy. But when I was reading uh, this definition, I said, okay, maybe that they mean the Mexican food. So a burrito, uh, but that's not a burrito, that's a taco. So, by the end of going through this definition, I learned that that's a burrito. I didn't have a clue what a monad is, but at least I knew what a burrito was. So the problem with metaphors is that they work for you. It's something that, for some reason, made you understand an abstract concept. But that doesn't mean that it's going to work for somebody else, because we have, like, I don't know, 50 people here, each of us learning a different way. So something that works for you is not going to work for somebody else. So. We cannot use uh, category theory. We cannot use metaphors. Do we give up and just use classes and inheritance? No. What we can do is introduce the functional concepts as we need to introduce them. And this is for a real case from uh, one of the companies. I was, uh, there's 
working on, a, uh, on an issue and one of my coworkers came and said, okay, look at this, I have this API, simplified version of the API. So I have a feature of an option, another feature of an option, and then when I use it, I end with something as ugly as this. You're probably not going to be able to see what is there and that's because it's a for comprehension with nested for comprehensions, match statements, I don't want you to see that because that's horrible. And in this case, it was not that bad. But the problem is that as long as you add more and more logic, things get mar much more ugly and harder to understand. So he came to me and said, can you use some of your FP magic and make it nicer? Say, yes, we can do something. We can introduce the optional future. Say, we are going to implement a class called optional future that is going to wrap a future of an option and it's going to behave like an option. So we have just to implement a flat map and a map because everything that has a flat map and a map can be used in a full comprehension. And then we can rewrite your API like that. Instead of returning a future of an option, you return an option of future. And then you can rewrite the full comprehension as a nice, simple full comprehension. And everything works. You get the same semantics, goes in much nicer, problem solved. And only then when he, we implemented this and the guy understood uh, what's the value of this optional future class, I told him, by the way, there is something called option T that is not only implemented for uh, futures but for everything that has an option inside. So we can get rid of uh, this optional future, we can use option T, and then you can get all the benefits of this uh, class that we implemented for free. Or not just for future, for list, for either's, for anything. And he was happy. I didn't mention Monad. I didn't mention Monad Transformer. I, don't f I didn't think it was the something I had to do. Uh, but what I achieved is that the next time he had a similar problem, he came back to me asking for more tips. And more coworkers came back to me asking for more tips to make the code look nicer and easier to understand. And at that point, I decided to run a workshop. We did a, a mock programming session. I introduced all these concepts. We were writing code. I was leading the keyword. They were just suggesting things. And now some of them are reading Haskell books and they try Haskell at home. So I don't think I could have achieved that if I have told this guy, yeah, just use, use a mana transformer. Just bring a Scala set to, the, to your uh, dependencies, use an option T, import this, import that, and you will solve the problem. And that's all. Do you have any questions? <coughs> 